So overall, what would we say? Not a great outcome. So what's the positive answer? Well, literature and practice show us that we deal with the fact that we're taking resources away from alternative use by trying to think about what the shadow price of that capital is, reflecting the impacts that we're talking about. And this is classic Tinbergen. We've got three issues here. We need three instruments to deal with it. Second instrument is to use the social rate of time preference. We use, suggest the social rate of time preference, which is what citizens are prepared to impose on one another when they look forward for a public investment. And that might differ quite strongly from decisions they make in their own private lives, but it's what they prefer as a social rate of time preference. And that might be, say, 3 to 4 per cent. There's two more numbers. <coughs> and then finally, we use benefit cost ratios to prioritise amongst the limited capital. And I re emphasise that the question of the capital spending capacity is a political decision. The capital spending budget is not a market that clears by fixing a price and then having the quantity adjust. The amount of capital that's available is virtually unaffected by the discount rate. It's a political decision. So what have we done over the years? Well, I mean, there's a tendency to say uh, by trimming the way that public advice is given, we've taken the bad advice here, but, you know, at least we saved 25 cents. So where did we get to? In 19, it wasn't 71, it was in fact 75, NZIR was asked by the, by the Treasury in a, in, a, in a valiant attempt to review where they got to, to write about what public investment processes might look like, and fascinatingly enough we came up with a social rate of time preference. We had a thing called the Z factor, which was essentially the <coughs> shadow price of capital, and we proposed using BCR cutouts. <coughs> also add, by this stage, many OECD countries are using the social rate of time preference, and if you look in modern CBA texts, this is the way the problem is handled. So, how did we miss it? Well, it was all about our own particular story. Once you get into this, you're so busy solving other problems that you don't go back and ask whether it was a good idea in the first place. We're too busy shooting the alligators to drain the swamp. Secondly, it was highly convenient for capital budgeting because what it does is shift the political process of saying no onto some kind of technical decision making with a high discount rate. So you can turn things down quite neatly and easily. And then finally, degree of ideology. If you read the, the, the somewhat reluctantly revealed Treasury files on this stuff, what you see is Treasury went about it really, really well. They took what we'd given them, they reviewed it internally with a whole series of real classy people looked at it, wrote about it, but then what they did was they realised they needed an international perspective. And Mr Tyler was at the Commonwealth Secretariat, so they wrote a series of letters to Mr Tyler to get the most up-to-date international results. And what did they get? Pure expressions of Brian Tyler's own ideas. And in particular, this one I put here, that the, the idea of a social rate of time preference would lead to marked and quite unjustified expansion of the public sector. And that was the clincher. That was the letter that determined the 10% discount rate would stay. So, how would you go about doing it? Well, you'd do some research on reasonable values for the SRTP and SPC. You might actually not worry too much about what they were going to be because the SPC, the, <coughs> excuse me, the shadow price of capital, ranged between 1 and 1.1 is a common figure. You might feel that's not going to make too much difference, especially if the benefits have the same kind of effects. They're going to offset. You can pull it out, cross it off the, off the criteria. But <coughs> if we think about the kind of rules we've already got in place, these wouldn't add too much, they wouldn't take away very much. We'd need a set of rules of engagement. Well, we've got some of those rules in different places. We've got the Green Book, we've got a whole set of rules that emanated from Treasury over the years about how to do this. And <coughs> but excuse me. any investment appraisal is full of estimates and subjective calls. And so all we'd be doing would be substituting one perhaps better framed set of ideas 
and one that did not prejudice towards the short term for a set that at the moment does prejudice us towards the, set to, the, excuse me, the short term. The key factor in all of this is for the social rate of time preference to be lower than the current rules. And we won't change the fact that constraints on public spending still won't clear on price and we won't change the potential for political decisions. You can't rule that out. This is essentially a political process. That's why we have politicians. But will we get there? Who knows? If we want to be intuitive or play agenda setting games, we can always do so, as this uh, remarkably insightful Dilbert at times. And <coughs> But the true public adviser is concerned to separate the real issues, avoiding a bias to the short term, from the extraneous matters that will always come into the subsequent political debate. That's my lot. Didn't even get to 18 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, John. Good to see that, unlike most academics, you can, can keep to time. I include myself in the former category. <laughs> <coughs> Martin, why is he wrong? Well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, one of the difficulties uh, with um, being second in these sort of things is not knowing what the first person is going to say and I didn't have the nerve to ask either Bronwyn um, or John what it is that John was going to say. This is a huge topic, um, so the most I think I can do is to pick on some parts of it that I think are interesting and would point towards um, discount rates for a large proportion of public sector projects that would be um, at least 8%. And I should emphasise, um, because this uh, point is not stated clearly anywhere, this number eight is not nominal, this is real. Um, so if eight nominal uh, frightens you, then eight real um, should terrify you. So let's see where this eight percent number comes from. Uh, it comes from uh, recent uh, Treasury thinking. Um, you start first by asking what would be a discount rate for a private sector entity and the conventional model that's um, used in the private sector in New Zealand is this uh, what is sometimes called the simplified Brennan Lally version of the capital asset pricing model um, indicated by the numerator term in the first equation. So you take the risk free rate, multiply it by one minus the corporate tax rate, add on the market risk premium and then multiply that by the beta for an unlevered uh, project. And that gets you, it's a model for determining um, a discount rate in the private sector. Now that model is applied um, in the private sector to projects that um, are subject to company taxes. So after the company taxes are levied, then the resulting um, after tax cash flows are discounted using that model. Now, in the core public sector, there isn't any um, uh, corporate taxation, of course, and uh, in an effort to produce some sort of consistency between those uh, two sectors, the um, discount rate is grossed up, so dividing by one minus an effective uh, corporate tax rate. And that's not the statutory rate, that's an effective rate that will be below the, the, the statutory rate. That produces a nominal discount rate and then that's uh, converted into um, real terms using the familiar Fisher transformation. And if you insert in um, to that model uh, the parameter values that Treasury are currently using for their so-called default option, so that's a risk-free rate of 6.4%, uh, uh, corporate tax rate of 30%, a market risk premium of 7%, um, an asset beta of uh, 0.67 being um, a, an asset beta for an average uh, private sector project, an effective corporate tax rate of 20% and forecast inflation of 3 out pops something uh, near enough to 8% real. So that's how they get to um, the, the 8%. And when you look at those numbers, perhaps the first of them that should jump out 
Um, actually, it was the fact that really the corporate tax rate isn't 30% anymore, it's 28 And you might think a forecast of inflation of 3% was a bit on the high side. It is, after all, the upper band of the, um, uh, the statutory range which the Reserve Bank is uh, aiming for. And we've had that 1% to 3% band for the last 10 years, and if you went back and averaged inflation in the last 10 years in New Zealand, you'd get to a figure of about 26 So maybe that's a more sensible number to, to use looking forwards. But the really striking number in all of that that jumps out at you right here and now today is the risk-free rate is not 6.4%. Um, averaged over um, the last month, um, the um, October 2012, the risk-free rate was 3.5%, nothing like the 6.4%. Now, you might be feeling at this point that um, I'm um, on John's side and I'm heading for low numbers. Uh, <laughs> patience, patience. <laughs> First of all, get our starting position right and then we can move on from there. So if I stick these more sensible numbers into Treasury's model, so the corporate tax rate's 28, forecast inflation 2.6, and the current 10-year uh, government bond rate of 3.5 nominal, pop them into the model, I get 6.2% um, real. And that's for an average private sector project. Um, quite reasonably, you could argue that lots of projects in the private sector are below the average risk that you would see um, in the private sector. Um, and, and therefore, um, there's an even bigger struggle to get um, up to the 8% number. Um, in fact, um, looking at um, this model here with the parameter adjustments here, to get to a real weighted average cost of capital of 8, you'd have to have an asset beta that was 0.88, which is about 30% above the private sector average. So this looks like a hell of a hill to climb um, in order to justify the figure of 8%. Now, of course, the figure of 8 wasn't set yesterday or even last month. It was set um, at a time at which the prevailing government bond rate was presumably 64 so let's see whether today we can, in fact, um, rationalise, justify that figure of eight for a large proportion of, um, of public sector projects. Uh, the first um, rationalisation I'm going to look at is to have a look at the fact that most public sector projects don't have a life of 10 years. Most of them have a life well in excess of 10 years. You might for example, be looking at a project with a life of 50 years. And with a 50-year life project, it's not simply a case of what is the 10-year government bond rate today, it's a case of what do we think the 10-year government bond rate is going to be over the 40 years after the current 3.5% rate has expired. Now, clearly um, we have um, an unusually low 10-year um, government bond rate right now, 3.5. And pretty clearly, interest rates are a mean reverting process. So your best guess for the 10-year government bond rate in 10 years' time or 20 years' time or 30 years' time is something considerably in excess of the current 3.5. Um, without getting into the maths of mean reversion processes and how quickly they revert, um, a, a reasonable starting point would be to suppose that in 10 years' time, it's a a fair time into the future, a lot changes in 10 years, that 10-year government bond rate will look rather more like the long-term average than it looks like the rate today. And what is the long-term average? Well, if I use the same uh, period for averaging that as I have for inflation, in the last 10 years, the 10-year government bond rate has averaged 5.6%. So if we are looking at a project today that lasts 50 years, the first 10 years cash flows are going to be discounted using a government bond rate of 3.5, but after that it's going to look something more like 5.6. Now, that tells you that the right rate to use, if I'm using a single number, must be something between 3.5 and 5.6. Does it look more like 3.5 or more like 5.6? Well, to get a sense about that, I, I just take a project that delivers, let's say, a dollar per year in real terms for 50 years. So in nominal terms, it's a dollar growing at the inflation rate of 2.6. And I discount back that uh, project. 3.5% is the discount rate for the first 10 years, as indicated here, and after that, <coughs> the subsequent years, the discount rate is 
that project is worth a bit over $30. $30. And if I were to apply a uniform discount rate to that project to give me the same figure of $30.91, that discount rate, um, that risk-free rate, would be 4.7%. And that 4.7 is, as I said, it's something between the current 3.5 and a longer-term average, but it's somewhat closer to the longer-term average of 5.6 than it is to 3.5.